Welcome, everybody. Uh, this is the Ninth Amendment version of Debating Our Rights. We've been doing this at the Putney Public Library since May of last year. Uh, this is a project that uh, the um, Board of Trustees of the library, along with Emily, the librarian, put together a, a great idea that more people needed to know about the Constitution and that we also needed to be able to talk about constitutional issues when we disagree in the same room. So out of those desires, this series was born, and I'm so appreciative of so many people coming out on a July evening to talk about the Ninth Amendment. Um, so for those of you who don't know, my name is Meg Mott. I teach at Marlboro College, um, and I teach politics and constitutional law. I've always been interested in constitutional law, for the main reason is I wanted to wrest it from the hands of the judiciary. I have nothing against judges. I tried to get Jack Wesley to come to this oh, one. Nice. He's a very busy guy. But I, 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 and because I wanted a judge to be around, not so that I would dismiss Jack Wesley, but I think it's so important that average Americans get to talk about constitutional issues and we don't cede this knowledge to the elite class in their fancy robes. <laughs> so um, this is great that there's this kind of enthusiasm. Before we get started specifically with the ninth, I'm just curious, what do you all think are inalienable rights? So that's gonna be one of the terms we use tonight. What do you feel is an inalienable right? And I'm gonna put it on this whiteboard here. Amr said, right to a comfy chair. You want me to put that there? <laughs> yeah. no. wait You'll that. wait on that. Jack. I would th say that an inalienable right is one that cannot be legislated away. Yes. Excellent. Oh, and that is, that is the definition. That is our classic definition. <laughs> it cannot be legislated away. That means it's pre-political. There may be nothing taken away because the state doesn't own it cannot be legislated away. Uh, Jinsi, did you have your hand up? Um, free freedom of speech. And that freedom of speech. And that one is protected, anybody want to guess? First, First Amendment. Amendment. First Amendment. Uh, cannot be legislated away. Any other? Yeah, and Janice. Also life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Ooh, that's a big one. Life, <laughs> liberty, and Pursuit of happiness. Where'd you get that language, <laughs> Janice? Made it up. Pursuit of happiness is relative. Bill, to Bill was whispering in my ear. Bill was whispering in his way. So, Bill, where did you hear that? With this language here: life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Oh, well, maybe in the sixth grade or something. In the sixth grade, is it in the Constitution? Uh, oh, nervousness, nervousness upon the, the masses. Declaration of Independence. Declaration of Independence, exactly. We learn it in sixth grade. Um, other things that we feel like are in, inalienable rights, and somebody mentioned, I think it was Eva, pursuit of happiness, hmm, how are we gonna gauge that one? Yeah. Are there other things that you feel are inalienable? Cannot be taken away from you because they are not there to be taken. Does that make sense? <laughs> I'm trying to, to figure that out. Yeah. <laughs> we have to go back and read the Declaration Freedom of Religion. Of Freedom of Religion. And where does that one appear? Also in the First, first uh, Amendment. Also in the First Amendment, right. So this one gets, shows up in the first. I'll make a star. This one gets showed up in the first. And there's going to be other rights that we've already talked about in these series. Uh, but the ninth is going to talk about the ones that have not been enumerated. They're the squishy ones. They're the ones that we sense, but can't point to the text to protect them. I'm hoping uh, periodically our little heads start exploding because we're talking about something that we sense, but is not in writing. 
just before we keep going, anybody have some other inalienable <laughs> rights? Uh, freedom from unreasonable search and seizure. So search and seizure, and where have we? Is that uh, enumerated? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Anybody know which one? Fourth. Fourth. Right. Freedom of assembly. Freedom of assembly, and is that one enumerated? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Where is that one? Three. Who said first? I'm pretty sure it's first. I do have this handy little thing in case anybody wants to be our, our constitutional looker. Oh, look, Eva's got a, a constitution. Yeah. Bill, Bill, Eva says you should have this. Well, he said he misplaced his. You can have it. I'll take it back at the oh, end. Okay. But in case right. there's a question, you'll now are, you and Eva are constitution mm -hmm. keepers. Mm -hmm. I, you can tell I'm fishing a little bit. Is there any other right that you feel like is yours that cannot be taken away because the government has no dibs on it. Yes, Allison. How about the right to protect yourself and your family? <laughs> oh, protect yourself and your family. Okay. What do you have in mind, Allison? Uh, well, I would say the southern border is a really excellent example right now of it not being respected. Uh-huh. Sanctity right. of parent and child. S sanctity of parent and child. And those are things we do not see in the Constitution. Uh, nigh. Freedom to love whom you love. Love who you love. Right. How about to choose your own vocation? Choose your own vocation. And choice is an incredibly important term here. Uh, choose who you love. Choose how you parent. Choose whether to have a child or not. Those are all um, what some, you know, and this is where we're going to get in contested issue. These fall under the category of inalienable rights. Choose your own. Did you say livelihood? Vocation. 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 Can you Bill. remind me your name? It's Bill. 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 Oh, Bill. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> I know your name, Bill. Bill. I always forget your name. Jesse. 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 Oh, it was Jesse. Okay. Anything else we want to get here before we move to the Ninth Amendment? Yes, Emily. Privacy. Ho, 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 ho. Do you want to say that again? Privacy. That's a big one. In fact, this has been a key interpretation of the Ninth Amendment. All right. I think wait, we're. Wait, wait, wait. Let's jump down to sanctity of parenthood and child. You, you said uh, whether you choose to have children or not. Yeah. Holy shamoli. Holy shamoli. Yeah, well, I mean, right to have an abortion? Right, right. So, exactly. Yeah, so that, and that is where we have a big contestation in this country. Yeah, Chinsi. There was a, I can't remember when it was, but there was a period not too long ago where they were uh, taking women and, and uh, that's the word I want. Sterilizing. Sterilizing, Sterilizing. Sterilizing. right, exactly. So uh, sanctity of parenthood is oftentimes understood as an inalienable right. You don't take away somebody's ability to be a parent. Um, yeah. So understood by whom? What? Understood by whom? Ah, by, yeah, that's a great do you question. Mean by the population in general? Do you mean by the Supreme Court? Do you mean by I would say to be in power? all of the above. Yeah. So there's not a concurrence on that, though. It, well, that's about what we're going to talk about. This is exactly where we're going. Now that we've ripened ourselves up with one, the sense that we have this very mysterious process. We're about to talk about something that's not written down. Right. And we're going to be talking about things that are deeply held and there's deep division. Sue. Uh, in the idea of privacy, also access to information. <clears throat> access to information along with privacy. Um, can you... <laughs> <laughs> and when you're saying it in relation to privacy, Susan Hesse, are you talking about that people's access to information should remain private? I'm talking about those two ideas, one informing the other. Got it. Okay. So I'm going to put arrows on both privacy sides. And what was the other one? Access to information. <laughs> All right, just because I lost uh, space on the board, we are now moving over here to look at the ninth, and, and as you can see, the subheading for this particular 
uh, discussion is opportunities for neighbors when the rights are ambiguous. So in Janice's question, on a, a large level, we're going to be talking about neighbors, decided by who? By people who live next to each other. So how do we resolve some of this? Um, just as a rem reminder for everybody around public deliberation and one of the advantages that we do public deliberation, uh, the first one is it promotes legitimacy of collective decisions. Normally, I highlight legitimacy, but because we're doing the ninth, I'm highlighting decisions. Because when you have unenumerated rights, it's harder to have decisions. Mm -hmm. And this is where we're moving into, put on your seatbelts, uncharted water. We're stepping off the Constitution and going into this very different realm. Isn't that wild? It's in the Constitution, it's out of the Constitution. I get pretty excited by the ninth. Uh, <laughs> the other reason that we engage in this is to encourage public-spirited perspectives, multiple, on public issues. So um, I don't know what th it, this conversation will turn into, but I would say it's about as contentious as the Second Amendment. Mm -hmm. Promotes mutually respectful processes, again, decision making. Deliberation is very hard when the rights are not enumerated, and decision making may be difficult. And it helps correct mistakes. So this is always an opportunity to look at, say, how the Supreme Court did decide how to interpret the Ninth Amendment and what some of the problems may be with that interpretation. Or how it was never a mistake, how they interpreted it, and we need more people to back that up. So it, you're very brave you came out. You thought it was going to be the Ninth Amendment. It turns out we're going to be talking about hard things without clear handrails. That's the beauty of the Ninth. Um, so it is, as I've been saying, non-enumerated rights. Would somebody be willing to read the text of the Ninth Amendment? Jinsey. The enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by this people. So if we were to um, use our whiteboard, freedom of speech, I'm taking it off because it's not part of the Ninth. If it was enumerated somewhere else, it's not part of the ninth. Religion, uh, religion is clearly out, right? Search and seizure, Search and seizure is clearly off. Assembly. Assembly is clearly off. I think everything here, well, privacy. privacy is not mentioned in the Constitution. That word does not show up. So if we feel that it is essential to the operation of the whole thing that it belongs here under the ninth. Mm. Uh, what, uh, yeah. So the draft, choose your own location, would that be any, when we did have the draft? Um, it so, doesn't show up in the Constitution uh, yeah. as a right so the, under the Bill of Rights. How what, did we get folks drafted anyway? <laughs> Uh, it's usually under emergency or powers of the go from the executive down. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I had two hands up, one nigh, and then Jinsey. I'm, I'm still stuck on inalienable and cannot be legislated away. Does that really mean cannot? I don't believe that. I believe that it means it should not be legislated right. away. But mm -hmm. if Congress... Wow. <coughs> chooses to legislate it away, right. can it do that? Right. Um, well, can it do it according to the Constitution? Not if the population at large feels it to be a inalienable right. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. But yeah, Jack. Such a right would then be challenged in front of the Supreme Court. Right. And the Constitution the judges. Judges. Yeah. So Not the people, but the judges. <laughs> so then, exactly, you, you do have a basis for trying to strike down a law. This is how um, anti-sodomy statutes in Texas were struck down. It was under the Ninth Amendment around privacy. And so it becomes the basis, as Jack says, uh, to bring a suit for cons on constitutional grounds. Jinsey, you had your hand up. I was up. just going to say, that just to clarify, I think, that this, the things up there we're talking about uh, 
are the we took out the things that were in the Constitution and so we're left with the things which, which we feel cannot be changed. We're left with these things which are maybe. Right, exactly. We've moved into maybe land. Uh, but if, if everybody feels that strongly and you can make that case in front of the Supreme Court, statutes will be overturned. So let's look a little bit at the rights retained by the people. Um, here are, here's a town meeting. Uh, one p word that I said before is they're pre-political. You have them before there's even a state. That is why the state cannot take them away. It is a function of being a human being as opposed to being a citizen. That's the difference between rights of the people. I'm not using the word citizen in this talk because we are talking about human beings who have um, associations that are not political. They're inalienable. So what does that term mean? Mm -hmm. to, to alienate something. Mm -hmm. to, take it away. to take it away. These are things you cannot mm -hmm. take away. Another term that gets used for these is natural. That they are part of the natural condition of being a human being. And so those are great terms, but exactly what did the founders have in mind when they came up with this? Very interesting amendment. So, specified rights, specified rights, specified rights. <laughs> Come on. Help me, I can't read. So, so uh, we can, I think we can pretty safely say a few years after the Constitution is signed, the first bill of, first ten amendments go into effect, and they include the ninth and also the tenth, which is equally interesting but not quite as metaphysical as the ninth. Um, so here's a question of what could the founders have had in mind when they were having this, con um, this conversation with themselves mm -hmm. and others. Uh, I just recently did find out that the Navajo people, the Diné, had a very uh, articulated understanding of natural rights. And I only got the book today. I was reading it in the hammock right before coming down here. It is interesting where there are certain similarities to some of the things I'm about to point out, but I don't have a slide on this. Mm -hmm. The idea is what kind of uh, political theory was in people's minds when they began to talk about rights. You're talking about men, not people. Mm -hmm. uh, men, women I, and, and uh, uh, a certain percentage of a black man mm -hmm. and so on. <laughs> yeah, what was it, three fourths or two right. and a half? Three fifths. Right. 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 Male right. landowners. So, right. <laughs> so um, but before we even had this kind of a conversation, okay. which Eva is pointing us towards, which is a more contemporary debate, one of the theories of natural rights comes out of the medieval era. And underneath those, I think Alison Mott may have been referring to some of these when she talked about hers, uh, the right to preserve oneself was understood in the medieval era as a natural right. No person should ne ever be put in a position where they were going to harm themselves. And that would be all persons. You could not create laws that would make people harm themselves. So the second one is the right to raise and educate one's children. That there is no way that any authority should ever tell another group of people what they should do with their children. And just because I sometimes think the medievals get a bad rap, uh, the guy I go to for most of this is St. Thomas Aquinas. And um, at that time, he said, Christians should never tell Jewish parents how to raise their children. That's against natural law. Huh. So that understanding was not just for Christians or Catholics. This was understood as this is the order of things. You do not uh, tell people how they should educate or raise their children. You also have, and this is one that's fallen off the charts, you have a right to live in society. So for the Catholics, they understood society as a greater priority than the individual. Mm. The first priority was to live in society, because that's how you understood how to flourish. You got to speak to more people, you got to uh, work together to do something beyond mere subsistence. This is a key right that, um, as you'll see, starts to fall by the wayside. And um, not surprisingly, right to know the truth about God, 
This is then, in modern terms, understood as the right to an education and the right to practice religion. Is that it? Yeah. So those, it, the last one sometimes gets separated into two. So those five rights were pre-political rights understood in the medieval era. And um, one way of understanding it as natural law is a picture I found. Hmm. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce his last name. Does anybody? Girlandayo. There you go. Girlandayo. Thank you, Nai. <laughs> uh, and, and I picked this picture for two reasons. One is because those rights I just listed are relational. They have mm -hmm. to do with living in society. They have to do with the relationships of families. Um, and the relationship is key. The other reason I picked this is it's natural law. At a certain point, people began to have windows in these paintings. And the windows always looked out at nature. And we could see this nature that was ordered, harmonious. Uh, if you look at uh, pursuit of happiness as a term, one way of understanding that through this lens would be living in harmony with others and with nature. Turns out that's also a Navajo natural law. It's societal first. And uh, now, the woods of Vermont may not look like that. <laughs> That's a little more uh, Italian Renaissance manicured. But the understanding is nature itself is ordered. And if we pay attention to nature, we will know how to fit our relationships in accord with that. Uh, does somebody want to read this? This is uh, Aquinas' is one of his famous statements about how it is that human beings can understand natural law. The natural law is promulgated by the very fact that God instilled it into men's minds so as to be known by them naturally. So one way of understanding this is in the divine context that our minds were so made by God that we understand what our inalienable rights are. In a secular context, it is our understanding of these things that we kept here are instilled in our mind, regardless of who we are, what language we speak, what religion we practice, no matter who we love. Now, there's going to be elements that we might run into trouble with. But the basic premise is that something is a natural right if you feel in your brain that that is so. No external authority, no constitution to help you. It's in your DNA. So it's a fairly optimistic understanding of natural rights. Mm -hmm. So, um, but this is the medieval understanding of natural rights. And with the early modern era, we get a very different picture. Uh, John Locke being the go-to guy for these. Mm -hmm. One is the right to life which is not unlike the right to self-preservation. The other is the right to liberty, which has to do with choice to make decisions for yourself. And we certainly had that up there on the mm -hmm. whiteboard. And ooh, it looked like it was going to go down Janice's pathway. But look at what happens, uh -huh. the right to property. So in the early modern era, there was a shift from social norms natural norms helping us to understand what is inalienable and it became far more specified um, and mm. to, to in many ways to some advantage so here's a passage from John Locke somebody want to read this all mankind being all equal and independent no one ought to harm another in his life health liberty or possessions yeah so a new term comes onto the map. Anybody notice what it is? Mankind. Well, we have mankind, so oh, equal. equality. So we have a new value system that's come in because um, in that picture that we had those family relationships, that is a hierarchical relationship, the love of the grandson, the care of the grandfather. Uh, John Locke turns it into equal and independent. So um, the unit of rights is now singular, the individual, and is not social, familial, 
uh, although John Locke would still call this natural rights. He says, somebody want to read this one? The natural liberty of men is to be free from any superior power on earth and not to be under the authority of man, <laughs> but only to have the law of nature for his rule. Right. So um, in the early modern era under Locke, and Locke is understood generally as the father of liberalism, the idea that we are all equal, we are all autonomous, mm. and we do not, uh, we are never under anybody else. So it is egalitarian, um, not at all hierarchical. So I found a picture to complement. So um, if the first one is the Catholic worldview, familial, relational, um, this other one, Da Vinci, da Vinci thank you, uh, is the individual and a very different picture. So uh, relational, harmonious, hierarchical, we understand with the first that the rights are in are natural in as much as they make our relationships harmonious. For the second one, the rights are natural in as much as they are individualistic, voluntary, and that's why this emphasis on choice is so important, and egalitarian. Hmm. Those are two very different worldviews hmm. of what it means to have inalienable rights two different ways to uh, perceive them, to uh, rank them, and are we surprised if many, many of the disagreements in the United States right now are pretty much along these terms. Yeah, Amr. I noticed for the first time in this presentation I got Locke's um, first slide that he showed that no one ought to harm another one. Yeah. It's a concern for safety. Yeah. And then the rationale is that because everybody is equal, Mm -hmm. So rather than everybody being having the spirit of God in them and hence being worthy of respect, mm -hmm. it is now trying to set up the new basis for being safe, really. Yeah. And then the mm -hmm. self is being seen as not just my interior world, but what I possess, what I identify with. So it's like a circle of self. Yeah. It's a life, health, liberty, possessions, everything that kind of is within my domain. Yes. Mm. Right. Right. This certainly a argument about possession because people declare this is mine and you can't have it. Right. And it's it's out of where they just made it up. Right. Right. Yeah. Thank you for for showing us how the key concern is one of fear. Mm -hmm. We need to be afraid because others may harm, and we are going to use the state to make sure that that harm is mitigated and we have an administrative state. This is what Locke's solution is to the state of nature. Um, and th so it's harm and it's also equality. Jesse, you had your hand up. I still wonder how the word voluntary is being used. Mm. So to voluntary meaning there's no coercion. If that earlier um, slide from Locke mm. says there is no authority above me, that suggests I am not obedient to anybody else. I am doing this as a matter of my free will. And that is definitely uh, a value that is reinforced in the, w once we move into the early modern. Does that answer your question at all? Or? Yeah. So voluntary meaning not coerced. Not a, even out of, um, you, can, you can make a decision and there may be some obligation in, in, involved but obligation is way down. It's more about this is what I have determined is best for me. Um, so if we were to take some of these inalienable rights that we've talked about, we can also see two separate sets. The right to educate your children, the right to live in society, the right to know the truth about God is more on the left-hand side. This is, is a much more conservative position and the right to make personal decisions about private matters is much more of a liberal position. So those two worldviews are coexisting, I'd say, still in American politics. Mm -hmm. um, and so the big debate around the Ninth Amendment, as I mentioned, has to do with privacy. And an updated version of these two pictures is these two. Uh, yeah. Right, where one is much more relational, has to do with um, uh, caring for the child, and the other one is, is very much focusing on choice 
and the individual picture. So are we surprised these two things, these two uh, world views is what I'm going to call them, are, have not disappeared. It's not as if one superannuated the other. They continue to coexist. So let's turn to Roe v. Wade, because this is where the Supreme Court was wrestling just this sort of question in the Ninth Amendment and the Fourteenth Amendment, but we're not doing that today. But the Ninth Amendment figures large in the court's decision under Roe v. Wade. Justice Blackman, who wrote for the court, somebody read his statement. Uh, the Ninth Amendment reservation of rights to the people is broad enough to encompass a woman's decision whether or not to terminate her pregnancy. Right. So privacy right, right to make decisions about uh, whether or not to have a child was recognized in row. Uh, Douglas writes a concurring opinion, and um, he mm. wants to really lay out what he believes the Ninth Amendment means, which is a little, what do I want to say? Oh, this is for public. It's a little, um, there's a little hubris in this, <laughs> because um, the Ninth Amendment, as we've been talking about, is ill-defined, it seems like, by intent. So here's this rather, I would say, cocky, justice who's going to step out on a limb and tell everybody else what the Ninth Amendment is. So this is what he lays out. Somebody want to read this one? Autonomous control over the development and expression of one's intellect, interests, tastes, and personality. Right. So, and, and emphasizing with, uh, voluntary, another way we could understand that is autonomous control. Mm. Why would well, you I, even need to spell that out? Oh, Douglas is a most interesting justice. I do recommend reading up on him. Yes, Eva yes, has well, something. I wonder if he said this, if Roe versus Wade came before his marriage to the 20-some-year-old uh, and when they threatened <laughs> to uh, uh, impeach him. Right. So was this written before or after that? Because he's so interesting, isn't he? He's a very interesting person, and I don't know that little bit yeah, about... That would be interesting if yeah. he threw this out. After right. they attempted to impeach him. After impeachment, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and he gets even more excitable. Yes. It's autonomous control. It becomes important to him. In autonomous control, exactly. Um, somebody want to read this one? Freedom of choice in the basic decisions of one's life, respecting marriage, divorce, procreation, contraception, and the education and upbringing of children. Well, and in that one, we begin to see a echo of some of the things that Aquinas was talking about. Obviously, um, education and upbringing of children remains mm -hmm. a, a key piece and um, that it's going to be something that you get to choose for yourself and you have that kind of autonomy. Somebody want to read this one? Freedom to care for one's health and person, freedom from bodily restraint or compulsion, freedom to walk, <laughs> stroll, or loaf. Freedom to loaf. Where is that t-shirt? This is ready to happen, right? Freedom to loaf. This is a Supreme Court decision, everybody. Yeah, so there's, there's Amr's comfy chair. Freedom to loaf, exactly. Um, so that's a big step. It wasn't the majority, but he put that in there. He really wanted people to understand what the ninth could be. And it's very much about choice, individual decision making, and, um, and to loaf. I love that one. Yes, Mary. Once a Supreme Court justice decides to enumerate something like this, does that become part of the law? Ah, so Mary, does everybody hear Mary's uh, statement about that once this becomes law in the sense it's a Supreme Court decision, mm. does that mean the ninth is now more defined? There, there could be an argument that that might happen. However, because it's not the actual case, right. it's a little bit off to the side. And you can believe the dissenting um, justices may have some <coughs> things to say about that. Yes. And I think um, certainly uh, precedent with this issue has been somewhat strong, but I think we can also see how it could also get a little weaker because this is not the same as getting it written as an amendment to the Constitution. Yeah, right. Shinsi. Um, I'm looking at the last one and it's, it's now it's so, sort of saying that it doesn't say there that 
that I mean, is, is, is it are you free to walk on somebody else's property or free is are you free to uh, uh, Mm. Assisted Low, suicide? When you should be working or and make your wife do all the work? <laughs> right. right, right. No, it's, it's very, um, uh, I don't know. Where is Douglas from? Was he from California? <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Or maybe it, Vermont. There's a lot of freedom <laughs> anticipated here. There's a certain uh, amount, nowadays we might say privilege, for him to be able to talk about, oh, I can go where I want to go and do what I want to do. But... Um, anyway. When was that in the road? Uh, so this was as part of the Roe decision. Was it 1973? This was in the last one. It was part of Roe. Oh yeah, God. so it's part of Roe. Uh, there are some dissents in Roe. Yeah. Uh, and the first is from Justice White. I find no constitutional warrant for imposing such an order of priorities on the people and legislatures of the states. So just as a reminder, and we may talk about this more next month with the 10th Amendment, at the time the, of the Roe decision, many, many states had relaxed abortion restrictions. So there was this slow building state by state by state, and each state was coming up with slightly different laws, but there was, uh, there's a famous book called The Hollow Hope, which says both the Brown v. Board decision and Roe v. Wade was an overreach with people wanting to make change through the courts, had they let the democratic processes go, it might not have become so contentious. Um, you can never judge history when it goes one way and say it might have gone a different way. But White is raising this objection that legislatures had started to figure this out on their own and Roe was going to be turning down all of those um, statutes. The issue should be left with the people and to the political processes the people have devised to govern their affairs. It should stay with the states, and that's the way this whole thing should have gone. So it's kind of interesting nowadays, we are right back in this exact same moment. And the arguments in 2018 are exactly the same. They don't change. It goes back to the states. That's what some people are saying. Um, is it, yeah. Isn't it true? That Vermont is a state that even if Roe versus Wade was overturned, that it would be legal in Vermont? I don't know what that would mean because what happened is all any statutes that were in place that didn't follow Roe v. Wade. So if our statute was always around viability um, and that the state only has a compelling interest in the last trimester mm -hmm. that, and, and Roe gets overturned, I would think that would would not have suffered from the Roe decision, so it should have been intact. But I don't know what the statutes are in Vermont, so that's a good question. I, I, I'm pretty sure that's true, but I can't say exactly why. And I know that not that long ago, um, and it, I even think it was Shumlin, um, with no publicity, got this rule from 1850 off the books. Oh. There's just this little rule about mm -hmm. prosecuting doctors who performed abortions. Oh, yeah. And I, I read that another happen. state just quietly did that yeah. too. So right. Um, right. That definitely happened with Shumlin about uh -huh. the doctors. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And did everybody hear what Emily was talking about? So that states are preparing themselves should that decision be overturned. It's not as if you go back to um, very restrictive laws, basically. right? You go yeah, back I to can look up the info. I'll, yeah. I'll get it to you sometime because I'm pretty sure that's true. And yeah. I'd like to know myself. Right. So, but I'm pretty sure. That's so true. you're saying that even if they overturn Roe versus Wade, it wouldn't necessarily it would not apply here in Vermont. It, it would. Be, it would go back to the state. Because not we, have, we have other you know, state yeah. laws were different, but so there state. were very free laws in some states. I remember, lived in New York State, and we were taking women in right. from Iowa. Because yeah. it was it was illegal in New York. Yeah, okay, I just right. that's what I thought you were saying. Um, so the next big decision around um, the Ninth Amendment <laughs> around abortion is Planned Parenthood versus Casey, 1992, and and I picked this passage from Sandra Day O'Connor. Does somebody want to just read this? Some of us as individuals find abortion offensive to our most basic principles of morality, but that cannot control our decision. Jack, do you want to read that? Our obligation is to define the liberty of all, not to mandate our own moral code. Oh, well, I like that. And I, and I reference this because, and so I'm somebody who's always interested in changes in thought. 
So if we had this more social, relational understanding of inalienable rights, and then there is a competing understanding which is very individualistic, and also uh, I might, we've, we've referenced the uh, uh, concern with property, that um, Sandra Day O'Connor is operating clearly on the individualistic worldview. So <coughs> was that compelling to conservatives who understood things in a more relational worldview? No. This, term, the, this way she framed it, that one was moral and the other was law, is something that um, many people found objectionable. It's, it's all right to say there's two moralities and that that means you're going to interpret the law differently. But uh, Sandra Day O'Connor made this claim and if you're um, in the individualistic liberal worldview, this was lovely to hear, absolutely. And I just also to point out how it would have been heard by another side. So, JFK used this same argument being a Catholic running for president. Yeah, that he was going to work with liberties. Yeah. Right. And that, he said, we can't make the laws for my morality. We make the laws for the people. Right, right. Um, so um, be, even with these Supreme <coughs> Court rulings that clarified exactly what was supposed to happen, and, and the Supreme Court was very clear in both Roe and Casey how um, these liberties must be protected, and that was the law of the land. Well, in 1994, maybe this is probably close for some of you, I'm, I certainly remember when this happened, mm -hmm. uh, John Salvi attacked two Planned Parenthood offices in Boston, both a receptionist at each was killed, the other people there were seriously injured, and um, so here was, the court was going to create clarity on what the law was, but within neighbors, within society at large, this was a very contentious issue. And I said violence and mental illness because he did try and use the insanity defense to mitigate his predicament. But given the amount of violence, and this is where I, I'm going to take us in a slightly different direction. I'm not going to rely so much on the Supreme Court to help us solve this problem. We see what the court has said. But what, um, what were people able to do when there was this major clash within the city of Boston? Six leaders from the pro-choice and pro-life movements decided to meet in private to find a way forward. They met in private, but they called their initiative the Public Conversations Project. Oh, I don't know if, really? if you all... that started? Yeah, <coughs> right. Um, so here are the goals of the Public Conversations Project, and it's interesting to the parallel between what we talk about in terms of deliberation and what their goals were. If you remember those four uh, goals that we had to promote, deliberate, why we promote deliberation, collective decision making, legitimacy, correct past mistakes, multiple perspectives, and treat them all with dignity and respect. They were finding a very hard time that anybody could live with decisions. Because the court had decided. And still this was happening. So what do you do when the court decides and, and the decision is still in play as if the court hadn't decided? Their goals were, somebody want to read this first one? To communicate openly with our opponents away from the polarizing spotlight of media coverage. And the next one? To build relationships of mutual respect and understanding. And the third? To help de-escalate the rhetoric of the abortion controversy. Mm. Mm. To, reduce the risk, to reduce the risk of future shootings. Right. So they're not, they start by not trying to resolve this. They're not trying to define the Ninth Amendment. They're recognizing we've got a lot going on here, and here we are going to come together, and, all we're going, and it's three people from pro-life and three people from pro-choice. Um, <coughs> and here is a big one. Oh. Somebody want to read that? Wow. The talks about would not aim for common ground. No belief that, given very different understandings of what inalienable rights are, those felt sensations are, if we have very different feelings about them, we are not going to find common ground. But maybe we could stop shooting each other. No common ground, stop shooting. 
That's a very interesting thing to put in there. Isn't that wild? Mm -hmm. Yeah. They understood that there was no common ground. They weren't going to agree on that, so we're not going to talk about it. Exactly. Um, so they had ground rules for discussion. Somebody want to read this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Use terms acceptable or at least tolerable <laughs> to all participants. So there was some question, pro-life, pro-choice, was mm -hmm. everyone going to be okay with those terms? Fetus, embryo, person, what kind of terminology could they use? Mm -hmm. um, and that took a lot of time, but that's exactly the kind of work they had to do. Nobody was allowed to use the word murder. Good. Good. Yeah. So um, another one. Somebody want to read this? What about the word God? Were they allowed to use that? So any group that met, if they determined the word God was acceptable to everyone, it could be used. So this was small groups, not a big group. This is a small group figuring out for themselves and understanding that the language is where all the anger got you know, got going. Um, somebody want to read this one? Do not interrupt grandstand or make personal attacks. Yeah. And this one? Speak independently, not as representations of, the, of organizations. And this is a key thing. I mean, once I started looking at this, there's so <laughs> often, well, I mean, Brattleboro right now has got the um, uh, racist posters, Black Lives Do Not Matter posters, mm -hmm. and, and it's very easy under those circumstances when people are rightfully upset to fall into as a da 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 I say this. This was against the rules for this group. You could not speak as a representative of a class, a race, a group, an organization, mm -hmm. a religious belief. Mm -hmm. The only way they were going to be able to come together is if they really were there as human beings. You think we could put this in the Constitution? <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I would read the, like, <laughs> so you want to know what the Ninth Amendment means? Here, check this out. Um, and here's so, the last one. Somebody want to read that? Maintain complete confidentiality unless all agreed upon a way to go public. So they call it the Public Conversations Project. So they are interested in possibly going public, not with common ground. There's no kumbaya. But they will only go public if everybody involved says we can go public. And boy, are they parsing their language in trying to do this. Uh, 2001, they did go public in a uh, piece in the Boston Globe. Uh, maybe you, some of you heard this. It, I mean, it was one of those amazing things, considering how contentious this issue was for this piece to show up in the Boston Globe, and it was called Talking with the Enemy. So clearly everybody involved was willing to say, yeah, we, we, we have been enemies to one another, but we are talking with one another from that position. And this is some of the quotes that came out of this piece in the Boston Globe. Somebody want to read this one? When we face our opponent, we see her dignity and goodness. Yeah. An opponent, right? Not saying you're gonna. I'm gonna persuade you. You're my opponent, but I see your dignity and goodness. Um, mm. Jesse, you use the word sanctity. So there's all, there's a level of dignity and sanctity of the human being as a human being. It's an opponent, not an enemy. Right, as an opponent, not an enemy, is what Jinsi just said. Somebody want to read this? Embracing this apparent contradiction stretches us spiritually and intellectually. Right. So that this engagement with others can have amazing impact on the self. Somebody else. It has made our thinking sharper and our language more precise. Yeah. And that one feels so key. There's nothing like speaking to somebody. And we got this so beautifully, I thought, with the Second Amendment discussion we had here last mm -hmm. summer where the opponents were in the room and mm -hmm. there was clear disagreement and there was people were modifying their language and and figuring out ways to not endorse but to understand one another mm -hmm. so this is a key piece understanding not in, without endorsement it's too often i think when we're doing deliberation we think we have to get we have to either have to persuade somebody we talked about that with the juries or avoid them in case they contaminate us. Yeah, nine. It seems to me that social media has had a really bad effect on mm -hmm. precision and particularly tweets. Mm, exactly. Yeah. Did everybody hear nigh about social media? 
and the effect it's having on language. Mm -hmm. Tweets. And especially tweeting. Tweeting, yeah, exactly. I don't, I don't tweet much, but the, the memes I see are pretty over the top pretty often. So the, you may not, fun. there may not be common ground at the end of their encounters, but they say they are more knowledgeable about their political opponents. We have learned how to avoid being overreactive and disparaging to the other side and to focus instead on affirming our respective causes. That's big, right? Mm -hmm. As opposed to belittling or disparaging, there is, okay, this is, I'm going to build my own argument. Understanding I may never convince you. Yes, Jensi. Do you think anybody's ever sent this to President Trump? <laughs> we, we, we shall. We shall take care of that <laughs> collectively from Putney Town Library, right. Public, Putney Public Library. While learning to treat each other with dignity and respect, we have become, we have become firmer in our views about abortion. <clears throat> and that feels very important. This is coming together to understand one's opponent. Understanding will increase your own spiritual and intellectual capacities and you will not change your mind, and no one else will change their mind. That's sort of beside the point for this particular thing. Uh, some people call this agonistic democracy as opposed to deliberative democracy. So um, the ninth operates, I would argue, beyond deliberation, because there is no decision. Uh, Pre-political rights, that we've been talking about, they're inchoate. That's a kind of a fun inchoate. word. I'm no, sorry, what does that mean? Non-specified? Non-specified, not formed yet. It's, it's, we're reaching, reaching, reaching to say it, and we can't, it's inchoate. Thank you. Um, they cannot be debated. I mean, when we feel them deeply, what our inalienable rights are, we sense them. And without persuasion, our only option is understanding. So the, the Ninth Amendment, I'm, you know, this is my argument, the Ninth Amendment is asking of us to not be just rights-bearing subjects, but to be neighbors willing to listen to one another, try and understand one another. And uh, I would have shown the slide even if Amr hadn't come, but I did find a picture. I wish there were more people in it. But uh, as I was thinking about this, what does it mean to really argue something, not, not even argue, to have an encounter with somebody who completely disagrees with you? And here's a passage from Rumi. Do you want to read this, Amr? Sure, yeah. Out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and rightdoing, there is a field. I'll meet you there. I wish this picture had people in it. Mm. <laughs> And because sometimes I think we look to other societies, non-human societies, such as flocks of geese, and they are our picture of what it's like to have relational harmony. And they just go, wah, wah, wah. everybody flies in the same direction, so much easier, human beings and their speech. Um, the leader gets tired and somebody else takes over. Right, and that's a natural process of the leader moving to the back. Um, so that's basically the gist of the argument, but I did want to, and this is a little bit for Howard who's not here, there is another objection to uh, the individualist reading of the Ninth Amendment, and it isn't the conservative relational family Catholic view. It is from Akhil Reed Amar, and he uh, looked at the Roe decision and thought it was an anachronism. He's a Yale Law professor. He says, to see the Ninth Amendment as a palladium, palladium of, of counter-majoritarian individual rights is to engage in anachronism. <laughs> this whole idea of privacy rights, that is a 1970s thing. It is not what the Ninth Amendment was ever supposed to be. Instead, the Ninth protects the right to overthrow the government when it breaks the social contract. And he relies on the preamble. He says, we the people, in order to ensure the da 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 da. It's in, oh, it's in my book that I gave to Bill. Uh, so when that gets broken, we have, under the ninth, the right to rebel. And that's how he understands it. He does not see the ninth as an individual right whatsoever. 
So this is called the collective rights interpretation. And if our Second Amendment people were here, and maybe some of you are Second Amendment people, you would see the exact same argument that we had with understanding the Second Amendment, which is, does it refer to a militia, a collective right to overthrow the government, as opposed to an individual right to make decisions for yourself? Mm -hmm. And the Supreme Court has, with gun rights, gone with the latter. I think, yeah, I think that's it. So, uh, any yeah. questions or <laughs> thoughts or, thank so much. yeah, thank you, thank you for coming out. Yeah, yeah, Jesse. Well, two things ring in my mind. I, to use the word the Ninth Amendment operates mm -hmm. begs the question. And Sandra Day O'Connor, because it seemed to me she was speaking for, she was holding for the liberty of all. Yes. Louder, please. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. <clears throat> so. Can you repeat the question? Yeah. Uh, so two things, and one is I was trying to get to the Sandra Day O'Connor mm -hmm. uh, slide. Um, sorry, there she is. Uh, that to say the Ninth Amendment operates begs the question. What, what do you mean by that, Jesse? We don't know how it operates still. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So how can you say the ninth, <clears throat> how can you ever say, I make, want to make sure I understand, that mm -hmm. the Ninth Amendment means something specific mm -hmm. when it's clearly unspecified? And I really like what the last slide says, but yeah. it seems like he's injecting something new that still destabilizes really yeah. the argument. He doesn't tie it up. Oh. Akil yeah. Reed Amar, yeah, yeah, the collective rights argument. So can't you see that everybody wants some sort of certainty? Sandra Day O'Connor says, I can bring you certainty, but I'm not going to define it the way Douglas did. I'm not going to say you have the right to loaf. I am going to say that um, uh, our obli obligation is to define the liberty of all. And, that, and, and the question then is the liberty on an individual level or on a familial relational level or Amar, a collective militaristic level. Or she says, uh, as you will have it. As, uh, uh, Both of you, all of you. Although she does use the term define. Well. And so define, she's defining the liberty of all as an individual matter based on choice. Right. Right, right. Yes. And as long as you subscribe to that worldview, it makes total sense. And then if you move into a more relational picture, it's, it's kind of interesting how uh, this can bounce up against um, possessive individualism, where I get, this is my body, this is my property, this is my whatever, and I get to do whatever the blank I want with it. And there's an, an element of the ninth which says, well, how do we protect the relationships? Mm -hmm. Right. You know, you got the whole earth, you got a problem. The, um, because they all are related. There's some, something, um, the liberty of all, not the mandate of our own moral code. I almost have something to say, but I don't have it. I've lost it again. It, it may come back, Chris, right? Yeah. Anybody else have a question? Mary. Well, the Ninth Amendment says certain rights mm. are uh, retained by the people. Right. But it does not define those rights, right. as you've shown us. So it's up to the Supreme Court to define those rights. Ah, now Mary is saying, does everybody hear that, that because the Ninth Amendment does not define rights, that it's up to the Supreme Court to define them for us. And that's a very reasonable expectation. How can you have a society when, this, when there's so much gray area? Um, I'm just curious because we, there's, there's another way of understanding it. They can only define what we accept. Because they can make a decision and then it goes nowhere. And I think, um, you know, most people would say Brown versus Board of Education in terms of school desegregation. We have great words, but it has had absolutely nothing. In fact, the schools, they say school uh, segregation is as bad as it ever was. <laughs> Mm. worse mm. so those mechanisms if we don't want to change we don't change 
So I hear in what you're saying, if we had a definition and the Supreme Court told us what to do, we would obey that. And that's, then we have to remember what John Locke said. Oh, no, no, there's, turns out there's no authority above any of us. We're all equal. And so but, we don't have that certainty. But, Janice. I mean, I understand what you're saying, but it, I'm not sure that that holds true. I mean, in terms of segregation, they did try to impose it mm -hmm. in many areas. And mm -hmm. there are laws that aren't obviously being enforced throughout the country to uh, uh, provide for equity in education. Right. Um, and the same thing, I mean, if you have, uh, you know, you can see that Roe is being eroded in other mm -hmm. states, mm -hmm. you know, that it isn't really being enforced the way it is, or interpreted the way. Right. The interpretation is fluid, right. you know. So, um, I guess the mechanism is there to enforce the rule, but it doesn't happen. Right, and, and what we'll see next month with the Tenth Amendment is it gets very, very confusing because the rights of the state usually have to do with education and with uh, public health. Traditionally, that's been the case. So when there have been efforts for the federal government to create certainty and then uniform policy, the states say, wait a minute, that's not what the Tenth Amendment allows us. So this is where our system, it almost throws the decision making continuously back on us. We may get a court decision and think we, we won, right. if it was the decision we wanted, or we lost because it's the one we didn't want. In fact, the way our system is set up, this gets continuously thrown back on us and how are we gonna coexist mm -hmm. given the sense that these aren't enumerated. Maybe they can't be enumerated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in thinking about Locke, I mean, you said something just in passing that seemed like a contradiction to me mm -hmm. when you were saying, when he was, he's all about um, independence and that you shouldn't be um, under any other person. Right. Or, but yet you said that his way around this was the administrative state. Uh huh. Aren't people then right. subservient to the administrative state. I'm so, that would all, so Locke's all theory of government, and it's a really beautiful theory of government because he was writing up against Thomas Hobbes, who mm -hmm. said, because the state of nature is nasty, poor, brutus, solitary, and short, uh, you needed to have a leviathan, this big power, and that would make people obey. So mm -hmm. it's an autocratic solution right. to human mm -hmm. beings mm -hmm. and their nonsense, their self-destructive habits. So for Hobbes, he said, you just get a strong man in there and you scare the bejesus out of people and they will obey the law and they will fulfill their contracts and everything will be okay. Locke said, no, 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 we don't need so much force. We can do this through reason. We are going to let people have a state to administer their property issues and their uh, conflicts with one another. So everything else that you had in the state of nature, you still have. And I call it an administrative state because you basically say, oh, I'm having problems with my neighbor. They're throwing pollutants into the stream. I live downstream. I am going to call a magistrate and take care of it. And the magistrate will take up my part of the problem. And we will argue it. It's going to be, um, it's going to be a litigation. And both sides will be heard and the magistrate will decide. So that's why I call it an administrative state. Yeah. Uh, Nye. What was the state of public education at the time that Locke was appealing to reason? Hmm. I don't know the answer to that question. He's British, um, yes, so it was going to be, what? If he died in 1704, it says in one of your other flags. Uh -huh. What was uh, the state of education then? So I they would, were I would, and, they were I, and I would also make a case for the fact of education coming out of the family and um, mothers, um, women in the village. So there was an understanding, uh, and it was a moral education. And it was not unlike some of the medieval training. So he takes this medieval understanding of the natural order of things and begins to carve away something that property rights go up to the top. Um, so in answer to your question, it's more informal. Mm -hmm. And then there are elite places. I, I meant even literacy, for instance. Mm, not um, particularly high, I would but, imagine. But appealing to reason would seem to be mm. an intellectual process. Right, mm. right. I, it's an emotional one, too, of course. Right, <clears throat> right, right. And, and then uh, for a lot of uh, the education goes through going to court. 
So you may be illiterate, but if you're spending a lot of time in court, you begin to understand how disputes get resolved. Uh, what was that Dickens bleak house? Mm. Jarndyce and Jarndyce? Anyway, the people learned through a variety of ways of how mm. to resolve their conflicts. Mm. So more informal. A couple more. Yeah, Lee. Can, can you say more about what um, St. Thomas Aquinas had to say about all of this? I find him, thanks for that question, I find him so fascinating because, um, oh, and uh, Aquinas on abortion was as long as there, it was before quickening, it was not considered uh, problematic at all. So in that sense, he's very close to Roe v. Wade. Um, really? Wow. So, um, what but, is quickening? Uh, is so quickening would be uh, around... Not what is yeah. it, but when is it alleged it, to happen? Around the end of the first trimester? First? Yeah. So at that point, it wasn't considered a, a person or a potential person. It was only when it started moving. Um, but his idea about nature, I've always love the idea that um oh sorry I'm, you got it it's the one where there's a quote from him ah here it is that uh all of our brains are what that we need them to be mm -hmm. all of our brains have the capacity to determine what these inalienable rights are it's a fairly optimistic picture so if i'm having a disagreement with somebody and they are feeling righteous about their position and I'm feeling righteous about my position. This from Aquinas, and then I see some similarities from what the Public Conversations Project were doing, mm -hmm. is you have dignity, I have dignity. Mm -hmm. Both of our brains are capable of wrestling with this, and mm -hmm. we're going to reach different conclusions, and, but we can still recognize each other's dignity. Yeah. Okay. It, it seems to me that the... Um, the fact that Aquinas and um, anybody else who takes the um, natural law perspective comes down entirely on the side of nature versus nature versus nurture yeah. um, skews the entire discussion thereafter mm -hmm. because um, some people would argue that the history of humanity is a progression toward um, greater and greater individual liberty, greater and mm -hmm. greater um, ability for societies to work together to promote common good mm -hmm. and to improve the lot of all. Right. And that that comes about through not nature, nurture. but nurture. Yeah. Learning over time, yeah. um, trying to avoid making the same mistakes we made two generations ago, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And um, the whole argument that there is a natural law that we all have inside of us mm -hmm. that um, is genetically putting us on the money, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think flies in the face of historical. Um, mm. Wow, hmm. so Amr wants to respond to that and then I'll move to Chris. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was thinking about that. I think it's, we've come to a really great place with mm -hmm. these, this tension with nature and nurture. And that's what I thought too when you were talking about the very pragmatic uh, perspective that uh, the public discussions project took, the conversations project. Because in strange way, we're at a place now where the best of our knowledge is actually confirming the nature argument mm -hmm. from the perspective of cognitive science and neuroscience. Uh, and if you were to expand the data set beyond some of the historical examples where humanity seems to have progressed, from the same family, a religious family, there could be people who might be pro-choice and there would be people who would be, you know, life. Right, same so, set of circumstances. Exactly, so how do we explain that phenomenon, right? So that's where the theory of nurture really comes up against the rub. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think uh, it seems that we're really in many ways pre-programmed to view the world a certain way, strange as it seems. Mm -hmm. And that nurture is not an absentee factor, but that idea that we became firmer in our views mm -hmm. through engaging with others was fascinating, that mm -hmm. this is the most kind of a detailed, empirical, long experiment carried out in controlled settings where people are reporting that they understood others, but yet what they was, got was a confirmation and clarity of their perspective on the world. Yeah. And just to add one other feature, I think um, the beginning of Genesis where um, you know, there's a story of creation, 
and God creates everything and says it is good mm -hmm. and creates a human being and says it is very good. Mm -hmm. So each and every possible disposition, the pro-life and the pro-choice from that perspective is still very good because it's being held by human beings. Mm -hmm. So that's a very interesting, very kind of non-historical way of thinking about that. Mm -hmm. There's a way in which we need to come to that place where we can acknowledge the goodness of somebody else's to what us just might seem like a really heinous position, but yet there's a way in which it is good. Mm -hmm. So absent religious vocabulary, where do we find that? That's a question that comes up for me. Mm -hmm. If contemporary science is telling us that, is that enough for me mm -hmm. to know that, oh, this person is just programmed in this way. They're bound to look at the world this way. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you have the vocabulary mm -hmm. to be able to do it. Like, what's that mm -hmm. common uh, thing? Well, I mean, one of the terms was dignity, but Mary, you wanted, Chris, is, is it okay? Chris, you're next in queue. Mary wants to jump in on this. My comment is yeah. short, but I, I think given all that, that it's simple. Women should rewrite the Constitution. <laughs> <laughs> Women should rewrite the Constitution? Interesting, because ovaries are... I uh, know, because those people who were in the public conversation mm -hmm. Were women. Yeah, they were. Yeah, they were all leaders. Um, the ones who leaders. figured out how to talk without shooting each other mm -hmm. and coming to conclusions without mm -hmm. changing the ground mm -hmm. of their beliefs mm -hmm. were women. Interesting. And so they, going back to the questions yeah, that I have mm -hmm. uh, are about that, that I look at you and I say, no, you can't do away with that child that's growing inside you. And you say, you know, my body's doing what my body's doing, and it doesn't make sense for me to have a child because I couldn't give that child a good life at this point in my life. Mm -hmm. um, are these two different moralities? Mm -hmm. and, and whose morality speaks at that point? Right. Can the person who doesn't have the child growing in them, do they have the right to, take, to, to make a stand at this point? Mm -hmm. And in this conversation that these women had, the pro-choice and the pro-life, how can the pro, how, how did the pro-life people take that stand and hold, my morality is more important to, for what you do with your life <laughs> than your morality is for what you do with your life. But that, that does not add up to me. Another thing that came up between Jack and Amr uh, of the evolution of society is the news today that the Koch brothers are now in, in favor of national health care because it makes money for them. It's cheaper <laughs> and it will solve some problems. And that's very interesting. <laughs> they finally figured it out, huh? That's but they figured it out. And it, it will pay them off. Mm -hmm. You say, you know, it's not left or right, it's what adds up. Right, so, right. Janice. Mm -hmm. So um, the public conversations project um, it's interesting that nobody and I think because of what the issue was, mm -hmm. that nobody really's mind was changed. Mm -hmm. I don't think it had to be that way, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. given certainly my experience working in intense circles and things like that right. for months and months, that um, somebody could, somebody's thinking could have changed. Right. Um, and in other sorts of issues, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I think it's not uncommon for common ground to be found. Yes. In this case, I mean, the common ground is the sanctity. They both, everybody, believes in the sanctity of human life is just how you talk about it. Right, right, you know? right. But, I, you know, when you talk that long, it's inevitable that some common ground, the common ground is respecting each other, Yeah. even. Yeah. Um, if it was a different issue, you know, and this gets to the nurture and nature thing, that I think that you could expect that there would be change. Yeah, and right. Move, there would be move, some movements. Yeah, and I think what you said about expect didn't you say if what if you go into a conversation movies. and you don't expect somebody else right. to change right you give it everything you've got right. but you don't expect someone right. else to change and that's where um the, the, you know the idea i tend to be somebody it's who's not your purpose it, right it's it, i'm sorry it's mm. not your right. purpose right, right. it's not your purpose right. exactly if I, I mean i like mm -hmm. all of this so jack if we took you and amar's situation where you're making a, a important claim which is the course of history because of liberalism thinking what john locke has offered things have gotten better for more people because more people mm -hmm. are able to make independent decisions and if we hold that as a, a important function of human life 
that's a compelling argument. And then, um, Amr, if we, if we take a, a, a more traditional viewpoint and think about it not in terms of, well, what happen, has been happening to family relationships or what has been happening to society's uh, network, social bonds, mm -hmm. as these individuals are becoming more decision-driven, uh, then we could, we could, I think, look for ways in which uh, quality of life has perhaps gone down from these more traditional societies. Certainly that would be the Navajo people's take on you all with your individualism, you're always figuring out the law is in terms of individual liberty, you are not paying enough t attention to the four sacred elements, and you're not thinking enough about relationships. And you're not taking traditional relationships, man, woman, f parents, children, seriously. So mm -hmm. I feel like both of those arguments, I feel better in a world where they're both happening. Mm -hmm. I really like this idea of these arguments continuing. I personally, and, and I've been on, uh, on situations where I've been on both sides of the abortion debate, I'm fascinated by Norma McCorvey, who was Roe and then joined the pro-choice. Yeah. Uh, I think Citizen Ruth was an amazing film to show how people get brought into a social movement and people don't st stop caring about the actors in the social movement and get much more interested in winning their policy. <laughs> so I feel better in a world where this kind of attention is going on all the time. Not and, so much attachment to outcomes. Right, right. right. Uh, epistemic humility. I think that, that's the piece that <laughs> I would really you know, want to take away from some of this, epistemic humility. Oh, uh, there was one other hand that was Amr. Yeah? I, I just wanted to add a different slight version. I would, I mean, I think we know that we're both on that page. I would love to have that vocabulary and that information mm -hmm. brought in. But the point that Jack brought up, which I think is such a key one and such a recurring one between nature and nurture, yeah. even if you were not to bring the religious and cultural aspect of historical values that mm -hmm. used to define us and might have fallen away in the majority, we now know on the basis of the way science is being used by advertisers, by big companies like um, you the know, Russian Facebook robots, and maybe? those places. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. They, they yeah. actually have identified enough factors that they mm -hmm. can predict with almost certainty that they can make you do something. Yeah. What does that do to our level of choice? So I'm prepared to give up all the religious vocabulary and mm -hmm. really look at human beings mm -hmm. as we are appearing. And it doesn't seem like we have that much choice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I would. So another version of the debate mm -hmm. you're saying, so mm -hmm. one would be a purely, I guess, secular, mm -hmm. but still the issue of that we think we are free, but uh, are we really, even uh, based on science? Yeah, <laughs> right. So where does this public the choice go yeah. based on that view and this data? Right, okay. So just because of the time, I'm thinking we should probably wrap this up. And I so appreciate, once again, everybody coming up mm -hmm. and talking about the Ninth Amendment. And we think we have choice. Maybe not, but we'd like to have choice, so we want to be better decision makers. To me, that's the Ninth Amendment. So anyway, thank you very much. If it's cruel and unusual punishment is ruled out by Amendment 8, Amendment number 9 says that other rights are fine, and 10 gives the rest to the states. Yo, it's the Bill of Rights, it's the 